today I want to look at being dedicated and think about how dedicated we are and how dedicated we must be. In serving God, there is no room for wavering. You have to be dedicated and steadfast and sure. So if you want to turn with me today, I'm going to look and begin in 2 Corinthians. It's in chapter 11. I'm going to read beginning at verse 23. And they are ministers of Christ. Are, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in debt, in deaths often. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day have I been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting, uh, fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now I want you to think about that, all the things it's talking about, all the things that Paul went through, all the things he suffered, all the issues, but he was yet steadfast. He endured. He was, in other words, he was dedicated in service to God and that he was not going to waver regardless of what come his way, regardless of what happened to him. And we see all the things that happened to him. I've not been through half the things that man went through. I'm not even in close to the things he's went through. And a lot of times, and today, at least in our society, at least in this country, a lot of times we don't go through anything near this. There's plenty of places in the world they do, however, go through many things that they can compare to this as far as being in perils and, and Christians being put to death and, and people trying to harm them or strike them or hurt them, but they have to be steadfast. If they should come to us, we have to be steadfast. We have to make sure that we don't waver and we have to be dedicated. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. And read verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promised. See, we have to hold fast that profession of faith without wavering, without going to and fro, without being pulled one way or the other way. See, most frequently, dedication is a catalyst that gives us and determines our success in accomplishing what God has given to us to accomplish, dedication, being dedicated to it, to being dedicated to serve God regardless of what happens. And as again, as I mentioned a minute ago, with Paul, it was very, very, <laughs> very evident that he was dedicated as we must be dedicated. I'm going to go read in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And there's someone I want to read about toward the end of this lesson that was that really come to mind dealing with someone that's dedicated. And a lot of times we talk about, and I relate to, the men that we see in the Scriptures, but I want to talk about a lady that was very dedicated. And because of her dedication, she is forever seen in the Scriptures by name. And because of her dedication. But I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm Rather, I'm in 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read starting at verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him, that he that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if any man also strive for the masteries, yet he is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. So we are to we are to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier, a good soldier, a lot of times we look at them as someone who is willing to endure the hardships that they would go through in order to accomplish whatever mission they're given to accomplish. Whatever task they're given, they'll go through it and accomplish it. A good soldier, there's many times we see good soldiers that because of courage are awarded 
valors are seen and they're given ammunition and they're looked at with honor because they are willing to go through whatever it was, willing to go above and beyond whatever it was to accomplish whatever task they were given to accomplish. As a Christian, we are to go through whatever it is, whatever may be in our path in order to accomplish serving God faithfully. Whether that's being steadfast in service, not wavering, going out in sin. Whether that's going out and we go out and seek those that are lost. We're unwavering in that. We're looking for those opportunities and, and making sure we accomplish it even to the point that someone would try to take our life, of course. We stay serving God and we are going to make sure that we do that no matter what. And I want to think about too, Jonah... Because of his unwillingness and his dedication in his mind to do what he wanted to do, he ran away from serving God for a little bit. Now, he repented of it. <laughs> he was shown what folly he was in. God was merciful to him. But nonetheless, because of his dedication to want to stay away from those people and not want to go to the people of Nineveh, he went the total opposite direction. Well, we have to watch and we have to guard ourselves against that. That sometimes there's things that we don't, our flesh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to go over and do that because we don't like that and we don't like the idea of going over there. And maybe we don't like the idea of those people repenting because they've been all kinds of wickedness. They've done all kinds of evil things. We don't want to go over to those people. Well, we need to. We need to. Just like Nineveh, the people of Nineveh needed Jonah. God knew exactly what they needed. He knew exactly what they needed. He knew exactly what needed to be said. He knew exactly who to send. They needed Jonah to go and preach them. They needed Jonah to go and tell them, if you don't repent, this is going to be destroyed. You will be utterly destroyed if you don't repent. Well, Jonah eventually did, and thankfully he did that. And those people, from the king all the way down, were in sackcloth and ashes, and they repented. They repented from the evilness they were doing. A lot of times we get in our own way and we're not dedicated as much as we should be because we let ourselves get in our way. Because we're not willing to step out of our comfort zone or we're not re willing to be uncomfortable, in other words, and that we would do that which is according to God's will because we're uncomfortable with it. A lot of times as a Christian there's things that you see and you're like... How is that going to work? How is that person going to come to God? I've seen them doing all these things. Well, it's because it's God's power. It's because it's in His Word. There's life in His Word. And that's our problem. A lot of times we say, well, I don't understand how that's going to work. And it's not really our business to understand how it's going to work. It's our business to follow what God says and obey His will and, and be obedient and dedicated to serving Him, knowing that His ways are higher than our ways and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and that He knows the right way. He knows exactly what we should and should not do. We just need to obey Him in short. But I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 55. And I'm going to read starting in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not hither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. Again, just illustrating the fact that God's ways are so much higher than our ways, that we can't even attain to it, that we're blessed beyond measure just being able to glimpse into God's mind, glimpse into the things He has given us. We're blessed beyond measure being able to have some of that wisdom that God has so that we can lead a life according to His will, so we can lead a life upright before Him. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean chapter 8, and I'm going to start in chapter 12, and I'm going to start in verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, man's weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For I am weak. For when I am weak, then am I strong. When I go through these issues and my weakness, God's strength is magnified through that situation, not that someone wants to be wants to be necessarily want to be persecuted in the flesh and have trouble, but that through those persecutions, through those reproaches, in necessities and in distresses and in affirmities, you know that you're serving God faithfully because the world rejects God, rejects the things of God, and when you are serving Him, you see those rejections and you are serving God faithfully. And through your weaknesses, His strength again is magnified because He helps you accomplish His will if we are faithful and dedicated. Truly dedicated. I'm going to go over and look at Daniel. It's Daniel chapter 1, beginning. Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding, science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace in whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them daily a provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that... At the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azrael. And unto them the prince of the eunuchs give names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and unto Han- and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azrael of Abednego. And the aunt, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank thereof. He requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now Daniel purposed, he purposed, in other words, was dedicated that he was not going to defile himself, even though he and his fellow, I'll say comrades, his fellow countrymen, the people that were there with him, were there as well, and that he was not going to defile himself just because he was over in some strange area or some strange kingdom with these people. He was not going to defile himself. He was there with the Chaldeans. He's not going to defile himself. He's purposed, and he's asking the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. He's asking him, made a request that he would not have to eat the meat nor with the wine which he in which they drank. He doesn't want to defile himself with this. He doesn't want to defile himself with these things. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So the prince of the eunuchs favored Daniel because of God. Favored him and looked well on him. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking that than the children who which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. So he was concerned about even though he was Daniel was in favor with the prince of the eunuch, the prince of the eunuch was worried about how the king that was over him would react if he sees that Daniel and his fellow sorts, or the, those that are with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is the names that were given them as well, how they would look if they are, don't look in the same manner as these over here that doesn't mind to defile themselves. He's worried about that. What's going to happen to him? He, and of course at that time we know that if a king said, Behead him. He's going to kill him. So if you didn't obey what the king said, well, then you're going to die. Okay. I go on down and read verse 12. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. And pulse, I went back and looked at pulse to get a better understanding of it, and that's herbs, and I've heard it referenced in different ways and capacity of that being herbs and vegetables in general. So not that meat, because we know that meats in that regard, we know how the meats could have been sacrificed to idols and all different things, and it could have been meats that they wouldn't have been allowed to eat, wouldn't have been permitted to eat, so we didn't want to have anything to do 
notice that. And he said in verse 13, Let our countenance look be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest deal with thy servant. So give us a little bit of time. Do this, in other words, do this. Give us Paul some water to drink and, and see what we look like in ten days. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. He's given them ten days to do this. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fatter, fairer, and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. All that because Daniel did not want to defile himself and was purposed and dedicated to serving God. He looked better. They looked better. They were better than if they had eaten the portion of the king's meat and drink that was appointed for them to eat because he was dedicated. It worked out better than what it would have if he had ate that, if he had defiled himself. I'm going to go over to Psalm chapter 57. You know, a lot of times we look at we look in the Scriptures and we can look at, and I want you to think about this too, Daniel, when he was telling this prince of the eunuch, when he was telling him this, he couldn't look ahead in the Scriptures like we can and know how it worked out. What Daniel knew was that God said don't do this, so he didn't want to do it. And we can see it worked out, but he knew what not to do and just didn't want to do that. But in Psalm chapter 57, verse 7, this is, describes Daniel's mindset talking to the prince of the eunuchs. The prince of the eunuch. In verse 7, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Daniel's heart was fixed. It was fixed on wanting to serve God. It was fixed on wanting to not defile himself. It was fixed on wanting to do what was right before God, regardless of the fact of where he was at at the time, or the people he's around, or the people that were round about, and all the other all the other people that were there and that may be able to eat of the meat and drink the drink of that was appointed to them. Daniel didn't want to do that. So he his heart was fixed. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to read verse 7 when I get there. If ye endure chastising, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastiseth not? But if you be without chastisement, thereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which correcteth us, and give them reverence. Shall, not mu shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, and live? For they verily for our days chast chast chastised chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness, and that we should endure. Again, enduring, because a lot of times I think about enduring, and I think about this too, when I think about enduring, I think about enduring the things of the world that are trying to harm us, but you know, we have to endure. When, we're, when we have done something wrong, and we feel that chastisement, we're being chastised because of whatever it is we've done wrong, our conscience being trained correctly, and we're being chastised because of that. We, are, we know that what we've done is wrong. That chastisement is a good thing, not that it, we want to be chastised, but that we know that that was wrong and we know we need to repent and we're supposed to endure that. Endure that just as, you know, when you're a child and your parents, just as the Scripture's talking about here, and the parents punish you for doing something wrong, same exact situation. A little different in that maybe how we're chastised, but it's the same situation in that we correct our children and we show them correction and they endure that correction, not they go back out and do what's wrong, but that they endure it and they go the right way. We endure that chastisement. We follow after what God says and we correct our ways. But I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth 
the will of my Father which is in heaven. And that goes back to being dedicated and that we're dedicated to serving God because someone could say that I'm a Christian and I'm serving God. They're not bearing fruit. They're not working for God. But when they get to the end of their life, they leave this life and they say, but I was a Christian. Are you? If you're not working for God, can you claim that? Is there proof to find you guilty of being a Christian? That's a really, a really good question for us to ask ourselves. That as Christians, is there proof that someone would find me guilty in the things I do in my life? Or with the things I do in my life, would someone say, Nope, they're not guilty of that. Couldn't find them guilty. You couldn't find evidence, in other words, of the fact that they're a Christian. They said they were, but is there evidence for it? I hope there's always evidence to show us that we're to show that we're Christians, that we're working for God faithfully. I'm gonna go over to James chapter one, but nonetheless, we have to make sure there is. Make sure there's evidence of that. You know, it's awful when you think about a sense of someone being put to death unjustly. It's awful the fact we think someone takes someone's life. It's worse. This is worse. And I know our fleshly side of us will try to pull in the other direction when I say this. If everybody in this world were going to be put to death for being a Christian, every single person, you take the evidence and you pile it up, and everybody was going to be put to death for being a Christian, well, you better believe I want to be on the side that had evidence to prove that I was a Christian, that I'm guilty of being a Christian, rather than people look at my life and say, oh, we, we don't even know. He's probably not. He's probably not a Christian. Well, that's, that's a bad state to be in. That's a bad place to be. No, we want people to know we're Christians. We want that evidence to be there. But I'm going to go to James chapter 1. I'm reading James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. When you endure whatever it is, it's not for nothing. It's not for nothing, as it says here, it worketh patience. Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. In other words, you may be whole in service to God because you're able to endure that, and, that, and through that endurance it worketh and makes you stronger. It makes us stronger. It makes us able to go through that. You know what it looks like when you have really tender hands? Your hands are really tender. And it's because you're not doing work. And as you work, you start getting those calluses on your hands, don't you? You get those calluses on your hands and they're built up. You know, it's the same way with a Christian. When we're a new Christian, a lot of things may bother us and a lot of things may cause us problems, but the longer we're a Christian, the stronger we get. And you can see that evidence of that working and that we're able to withstand more, we're able to do more, and we're able to serve God more faithfully. Because we've endured and we've got those scars, if you will. We've got those times that we had to deal with whatever it is those issues were and we knew how to deal with it and we worked through it and we stayed faithful to God. I'm going to go and read verse 12 in the same chapter, same book. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, stands fast, that doesn't let that push him from side to side, that doesn't let him that topple him over, that doesn't let that push him out of the way, but is the man that endureth, is the people that endureth, the Christians, those that are willing to stand fast. They're blessed. They're blessed. And it's not God that tempts us. It's not Him that tempts us. But there are temptations in this life, there are issues in this life that we must endure if we want to be found faithful. 
I'm going to go to Psalms chapter 100. Verse 5. I'm going to read starting verse 4, rather. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. It stretches from one to the other. It's not like earthly wisdom and knowledge which changes and they're like, well, I think this is right. Now, when God says that it's right and it endureth and it is magnified throughout the generations, as long as people live, they see this and they go back and see, you know, God's way was right. His way was right. And it's up to man to do that, but it's pretty much true. I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. We can't change the gospel. We can't change the truth of the word in order to fit the world. When we do that, you know, that's exactly what it's talking about here. That's exactly what it's talking about. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. When we change the things in order to suit ourselves, to suit people around us, to suit the world, to suit leaders, magistrates, whatever it may be, whatever position you plug in the position, we change the truth. We pervert the gospel. And it says here, if we pervert the gospel, let him be accursed. That's a dangerous situation to be in. So we never change the truth. We never change or try to because we can't really change it. But we can try to we can try to make it look like the way we want. We can try to mold it the way that we think something should look. But it says right here that if anyone should do that, whether it's an angel from heaven, whether it's anyone that should do that, let him be accursed. That's a sad situation to be in, to know the truth and to be a curse because I wanted to change something that I liked better. We can't do that. We endure, we endure, and we continue to serve God. I'm turning over to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried with carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into, uh, into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, making in increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love, that I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart." If we don't endure, we can find ourselves in that situation as well. That because we didn't, we weren't dedicated and we did not want to endure, we can cause ourselves to be alienated because we decided to not serve God faithfully and we wanted to go that way. That way was easier. That way was more comfortable. That way seemed like a better idea. We find ourselves alienated because we didn't want to endure. We didn't want to endure those things that we need to, that's necessary. We didn't want to endure somebody making fun of us. We didn't want to endure the hardship to, of loss of these things because it was more profitable financially for us to go over there. We can find favor in man's eyes if we follow that way. But we would be alienated. We can't do that. They ever, ever want to do that. I'm going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 
I'm going to read starting at verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ is the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds by the word of God is not bound. There, uh, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Perversion of the gospel. That's a good example of perversion of the gospel, perversion of who Christ is, if someone should deny Christ. That might be a path that someone would say, well, it was easier for me to do that than it was for me to proclaim who Jesus Christ is because, plug in whatever it may be, I wouldn't get this or that would happen to me. That's a lack of endurance. I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. we we'll restart in verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We are not of those that draw back. We're not of those that would go back into the world, that would draw back from serving God. No, we must be those that endure. Endure whatever it is that comes your way. Endure those things that, are, that come your way that try to pull you out. I'm going to go to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to read verse 12 when I get there. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Don't forget that. Patient in tribulation. When perilous times come, that's when your faith is tried. That's when your faith is tried. It's when perilous times come. Now, maybe on a small scale in that who you're around, or maybe on a grand scale because of what's happening in the world. It may be all over the place. You may be tribulations. You may see hardships. You may see turmoils. You may see all things being upset, upside down. Left is right, right is left. Up is down all over the place. In those times, be patient in tribulation. Patient. Wait on the Lord. Patient and continually serve God. Endure. I'm going to go to Second Peter there's a few last verses I want to look at with you this morning. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Now I said at the beginning I wanted to look at someone because of her endurance. Her name is forever written in the Scriptures. Her name is remembered in the Scriptures. Her name is very important to us thinking about endurance. And I'm going to go over and it's the book of Ruth. And it's an individual in the book of Ruth. I'm going to go over to Ruth chapter 1. You know, I think about this too. A lot of the books that we look at, they're huge in comparison to Ruth. They're large in comparison to Ruth. Yet what transpired here in the book of Ruth should give us pause to see how that this transpired, to see how that this took place. But in Ruth chapter 1, verse 3, And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons, Naomi's two daughters, or daughter-in-laws, had sons by Naomi and were married to them. And go over and read in verse 15. And she said, and they passed away, both of them passed away, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law, 
And it was Ruth's sister-in-law that had went back, and Naomi's other daughter-in-law, that she'd went back to her people. She was going to go back. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Wherefore thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw, and this was Naomi talking about Ruth, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded, this was Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, Naomi, then she left speaking unto her. So, Ruth was very steadfast in that she did not want to leave Naomi, her mother-in-law. She wanted to stay with her mother-in-law. She didn't want to leave her. Now what happened though because of that? It's amazing when you tie it to the New Testament. In chapter 2, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech. This was the same one we're talking about here, Elimelech was the man was Elimelech. In verse 2, the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, Naomi. Now Boaz, as it says here, Elimelech, and in verse 1, in chapter 2, I'm finishing reading that, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she, she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hat was too light on a part, and the field belonging unto Boaz was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servants that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? So he was immediately interested in Ruth. Whose damsel is this over here that I see? Who is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is a Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Harvest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in any other field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. So he seen her and he was, he was immediately wondering who she was and he's also telling her, don't go anywhere else. You stay right here, you glean here, you stay with my maidens and you glean in this field. And because that Ruth was steadfast, I'm going to go over and read Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to read about Ruth. It's amazing to think about this, how this is tied together. In Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, And Solomon begat Boaz, and Rahab, Rachab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon unto her that had been the wife of Urias. Ruth's name being the great-grandmother of King David is forever tied within the lineage going all the way down to Joseph. All the way down in verse 16, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Because Ruth was steadfast and did not leave her mother-in-law, and at first, wouldn't even she wasn't even adhering to her. Now, Naomi gave Ruth some good advice as we read down through the Scriptures. If we were to go back to Ruth and read a little more, she gave her good advice, but Ruth didn't want to leave her. But because of that, again, her name was forever and is forever ascribed here. And when you read the first book of the New Testament, her name is here. It just It's amazing to think about that, being steadfast. Now, all that Ruth knew is that she wanted to be steadfast. 
What she knew is that she wanted to tarry and continue with Naomi and that she did not want to leave. Now, she's making the right decision when she said that your God will be my God. That's the same God that is the God, not little g idols, but big G, the God, who we serve, and her name is forever written here. And I thought about that because of her endurance. Her name is permanently written. But just like as a Christian, that if we endure until the end, our name being permanently written and is written and will be there in the Lamb's book of life, if we endure likewise. It's amazing to think we see her written here, but imagine how amazing it is to think our name written there. If anyone's not a Christian though, if you're not a Christian, that name's not written there. That name's not enshrined there. That name's not found there. So I want to read these scriptures for the benefit of someone that's not a Christian so that they may obey the gospel so that name can be written there. In Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In Luke 13, 3, I tell you, nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Mark 16.16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. That wonderful opportunity, but also that wonderful warning to us to not to follow the wrong path. hope that you would think on those things as we come together sing the selected song.